Welcome to you all to this week's G Echo meeting. Um, it's very exciting. We've got um, 15 countries participating. There were more than 100 registrations. I'm sure many people will still come, but uh, knowing how it works in medicine, some people uh, might be caught up in other things. But welcome to all of you. Um, and I'm just going to quickly mention the countries here Botswana, Cameroon, Ghana, Ethiopia, Kenya. The Maldives, Mozambique, Namibia, Nigeria, the Sudan, Switzerland, Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and uh, South Africa. So it's awesome to have uh, so many people from so many different places uh, joining us more and more. And uh, we're excited about the fact that patient blood management is really gaining a huge amount of traction around Africa. So just as a reminder, so this G Echo program is hosted by the Gastro Foundation uh, in association with Project Echo at the University of New Mexico. And, and, and these sessions are held every week on a Wednesday. I want to really encourage everyone to, to make this meeting your own meeting, to take ownership of it. It's something we do together to learn together. And I want to encourage you to ask questions, maybe put your questions in the chat box. I don't, you can also speak up and ask your questions at the end, of course. Um, but you're so welcome to, to really be a part of, of this. I want to also use the opportunity now, and I'm going to mention something again at the end, to just let you all know that our second Sub-Sahara Africa Patient Blood Management Conference is taking place this weekend. And it will be uh, Saturday the whole morning until around about lunchtime. And we've got speakers from all over, even Prof. Axel Hoffman from Switzerland will, will be giving some lectures. We're very excited about it. We, the previous meeting was absolutely fantastic. So please feel free and we'll, we'll put up an advert at the end to just show you a bit more about that. So that leaves me only to welcome our speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Petrolise Vessels, who I've known for a very long time. Uh, she's based in the Free State. We've known each other from the time that she did a postgraduate diploma in transfusion medicine. And from there, she's become a very important person in the South African National Blood Service, as she is the lead consultant on patient blood management. So a wonderful, wonderful privilege to have you with us, uh, Petra Lees, all the way from Bloemfontein. And we look forward to your talk. And you might think, but isn't patient blood management in competition with the blood services? Well, today you're going to hear how the blood service feel or feels about patient blood management. So with that, I'm handing over to you, Petra Lees. You're welcome to share your screen. And uh, we look forward uh, to your talk. Welcome. Thank you, Vernon, and thank you very much uh, for Gastro Echo to allow me the opportunity to share with all of you Sanvis's take, or if I can call it like that, on patient blood management. Uh, like Vernon said, uh, I'm looking after patient blood management, and so for all of you who had a long day, let's start with the summary of the talk. And then if you need to go and pop off for a quick coffee, then you can do so, you know what the talk is gonna be about. For those of you who are expecting a very stiff, formal academic lecture, I think you might need a cup of coffee as well at this stage. So what will we be talking about today? Um, why did we become involved in, in PBM? How did we become involved? What have we been doing in the background? How do we see ourselves contributing and what did we start doing differently? And then a couple of quick case studies, and then you will be free to have something more than a cup of coffee. So why did Sanvis become actively involved in patient blood management? Uh, many of you might know that the Sanvis purpose statement is trusted to save lives. And that means that we need you as the, the doctors, as the nurses, as the the healthcare managers uh, to trust Sanvis that we can help you to save those lives. We need the patients in South Africa to trust Sanvis to help you save their lives. And we very much need the donors to trust us 
to help all of you to use their blood appropriately. Now, if you think about PBM initiatives that have been proven to optimize patient outcomes and in that way ensure appropriate transfusions, it goes to without saying that Sanders and PBM was a match made in heaven and probably one of those forever friendships that you will come across. So how did we become involved in patient blood management? In 2017, Prof. Axel Hoffman and Prof. Hans Gombots visited Sanders and Sanders started talking about patient blood management. In 2018, we were very fortunate to find our soulmates in the gastro world. It was the first uh, team we teamed up with. And Sanders made a very brave decision to dedicate resources to patient blood management to further this. In 2019, it was the first PBM working group and interest group meetings in Cape Town. And from that, this article was published in the SAMJ. So looking at that article and some extracts of the article, how did Sanders see themselves contributing to patient blood management in South Africa? Now, if you read the article, you will see that it is a call to action. And given our Sanders footprint over eight of the nine provinces and the fact that we interact with so many doctors and we do a, a large education program of eight to 10,000 healthcare workers a year, if somebody needed to call, I think our voice could be heard far and wide. So we thought, okay, we can do the calling. We, that, that we're good for us. Then they said we need relevant stakeholders to be thoroughly informed. And part of our normal Sanders life is to supply education and hospital support to the almost 500 transfusing facilities that we service in the eight provinces. We also interact with them on hospital transfusion committees and we also supply them with Sanders generated reports to these platforms. So if somebody could share information relevant to clinical information, patient blood management, Sanders thought we could do that for, for all of us. Guidelines, algorithms, and other useful tools. It's another extract from the article. And we have long before we even started to focus on patient blood management as a, as a company, we were developing and distributing tools to hospitals and to provinces. And we are focusing on developing and distributing a practical tool after collaboration with a hospital that we develop something for them that they can actually use and that they want to use. The article also talks about PBM pilot projects. Now, how did we see ourselves contributing to that? We gather a lot of information. We, our data warehouse is massive. So apart from the data that we can supply to something like this, there's also logistical issues that we can advise on. And most definitely, I think the thing that we are really good at at Sanders is we can tell you what can go wrong. So you can get your what can go wrong inputs from Sanders. Implemented as a mandatory national standard of care, we very much see ourselves as the collect part of the collector voice in South Africa. And we hope that the data that we have available could actually help build a factual case that we can push to mandatory implementation in South Africa at this stage. But most of all, and this is something new, and we're going to embark on this in, in 2021, we want to make the patient and the public aware of patient blood management, especially around anemia awareness. And we truly want to empower our patients and our public. So what were we always doing in the background? Because you need to understand what we were doing to understand how we, we, we changed our focus. In the background, Sanders' service delivery, training, hospital support, all of those things were always running. And they were focused on promoting getting the right product to the right patient at the right time. Now, for those of you who think that is a short explanation, you need to understand the background to what I've said now. It includes all our donor and our donor care products uh, to ensure that we have enough blood. It also is all the logistics involved in having a sustainable supply of quality blood across eight provinces in a country as geographically challenging as South Africa is. And if you think of Lusiki Siki, if you think of Springbok, uh, Port Nollis in the Northern Cape, we are talking vast distances and none of those emergency fridges must run out of at least one or two units of O blood. Safety aspect, 
uh, for those of our colleagues who's outside of South African borders. We do individual NAT testing, nucleic acid amplification testing. We've got a lot of QC uh, processes running in the background, and we truly are benchmarking our processing centers against world-class facilities. We also always have the hospital support functions. We were always advocating for appropriate transfusion practices, and we were always driving towards prevention of wastage of scarce resources. Our training and education initiatives were running since I joined SAMBIS 10 years ago, and it will continue running long after I go on pension. We are also collecting information from hospitals since you started giving it to us, basically. And the other thing that we have always been involved in is guidelines. You know the clinical guideline for the use of blood and blood products in South Africa, the little red book. Uh, we've got the navigation so to a safe transfusion that's written from a, for a nursing perspective, very practical. We have got our little emergency fridge uh, manual. We have got an intern induction booklet. So all of those things has always been happening in the background. What did we start to do differently when we said, okay, let's go for patient blood management as a company? We became patient focused. And that sentence trusted to save lives sounds like a very small thing. And when I try to explain this to, to people, one person asked me one day, oh, so you changed the course of the ship. I don't think we needed to change the course of the ship. We definitely did not change the course of the ship because if we changed course, we would be moving away from a quality, sustainable, equitable distributing service. So we cannot uh, afford to change the course of the ship. I think it's more like a ship that had windows on the one side, looking very much at the product and product quality, and the patients might have been on this side of the ship. And not that we were ignoring them, but because there was no windows on the right side of the ship, we, they were not in our face, we were not looking at them. So I think what Sanders leadership did, and hats off to them, we, we've got visionary leaders, uh, they took the ship back to the docks and they installed windows on the right-hand side of the ship. And now we could see our patients. Now we could see our hospitals. Now we could see all of you. And we were very much made aware of all of you. But the other thing they did is they put windows that can open on that side of the ship. So now we could also hear you. And I think if you ask me what trusted to save lives means, that is probably the best explanation I can give you. A lot of resources were allocated to patient blood management in Sanders. Um, it's not just me and my little team of six hospital liaisons. We're talking about the rest of the medical division, the whole technical division, our blood bank staff, our IT division has done amazing work and they are still doing amazing work with new reports that they're generating our marketing department. I don't think there's a single division in Sanders that did not in one or other way started contributing to patient blood management. Reports, uh, in the old days, all the hospitals wanted to know is how big is the blood bowl? And we were reporting on units used, after hours charges, and all of those things. What we started to do is we started to focus our reports on clinical indicators that rather speaks to the patient and patient blood management instead of just the product. And we are actively and monitoring, uh, monitoring and reporting to our stakeholders. And some of the interesting things that we are keeping an eye on is our one unit at a time, which is a big project for Sanbus this year. It's actually on the corporate scorecard. Um, and then also our PBM fact sheets, which we are very proud of that we started circulating to hospitals early last year. We are monitoring turnaround times because we are very aware how logistics influence your ordering practices. We are monitoring ICD-10 codes and you will see in one of the case studies why we are so adamant that ICD-10 codes must be done correctly. We're in the old pre, I mustn't say old days, I must say pre-PBM focused days, we were also only talking about inappropriate transfusions. We now started to ask hospitals, if you look at your usage per department and you look at your usage in your, let's say general surgery or orthopedics department, and you think of your long waiting lists, do you not think that some of these could be preventable transfusions? 
So we are shifting the focus slightly with our feedback. We also said, okay, H, but let's take a different approach to discussion platforms. And we need to go for a patient focus instead of a product focus. Uh, we also had this thing of let's start with hospital transfusion committees, individual, and we'll try to go bottom up. We now said, no, we want to top down as well. And we established a provincial coordinators forum across nine provinces, two black services, and that is a de Department of Health discussion forum where everybody now participates in. We also are through that forum advocating collaboration and benchmarking across provinces. We definitely had to modernize our approach to education. COVID didn't leave us much of a choice. And Daniel and Tabiso in the IT department did wonderful work. And we now have a Sandbus digital uh, training and education platform. We are looking at accessibility. We placed routers at Black banks that the hospitals can use to access our WebEx trainings and our WebEx meetings. And we are focusing a lot on collaboration in asking hospitals, how can you be trained? Can we maybe accommodate them in whatever way is feasible for them? Definitely inside Sandbus, cross-functional teams has become the buzzword and also our ticket to success. And what we are doing in those cross-functional teams is we are investigating awareness, we are investigating obstacles around alternatives in South Africa, because we very much would like to see more alternatives being widely implemented. But we're also looking at our future potential to maybe assist in providing some of these alternatives to the country. And we're looking about uh, cell saver service. We have just validated 24 hour BRB, blood on returnable basis hamper. And a big dream for a couple of us, but it's still in the early stages, that's why it's in brackets, is the, the concept of using the Sandbus footprint to drive anemia and iron clinics. Public awareness, like I've said, we're going to venture into that this year, and we're going to focus specifically around anem on anemia awareness. And then Vernon said, very, very nicely on a very polite WhatsApp. He says, Ach, and please include a case study. And my first response is a case study, a clinical case study from Sanders. And the next thing that went through my mind was how my preconceived idea of how a case study must look is actually the backbone of the case studies that I want to share with you. What I want to share with you now for the rest of the talk is how often our preconceived ideas, our misperceptions, and our communication breakdowns are in fact slowing us down on our road to implementing patient blood management. And our biggest mistake, and I say this not quoting literature, I say this working with hospitals for the last 10 years as a Sandus representative, our biggest mistake is making assumptions. They don't want to become involved in patient blood management. I hate hearing that statement. They can implement, why don't they? That's a very good question. Why don't they? Have we sat down with them and actually talked to them about why they don't implement? Our perception is that they can implement. And the one that I hate most is they don't care. They're just here for the paycheck. I hate to hear that because I have yet to encounter a healthcare worker in South Africa who don't care and was just there for the paycheck. So the first case study. I want to show you how the impact of logistics causes delays and how that delay actually impacts on transfusion practices and therefore on patient safety. So we have a hospital in the private sector that has got a large blood using patient population and I mean huge. They have a courier service. Before you fight with me, the courier service is not paid for by Sanders. And the courier service transports samples and blood products between the hospital and the blood bank. This hospital is very pro-PBM. They, they feel very strongly about this. They advocate for the use of cross-matched blood, and they do not advise the use of emergency cross-matches of uncross-matched units from the emergency fridge. What we noticed on our side was an increased number of orders that was for three or more red cell units per order. 
despite the hospital being close to the blood bank and having a courier service. And the reason we were so worried about this come from our interactions with nurses across the country. And they will tell you, if a red cell is in the ward, that red cell is usually going into the patient almost 100% of the time. And that is completely against our efforts to reduce unnecessary risks to our patients, especially if you think of the dose-dependent negative outcome of transfusions. The hospital on the other side said, but you don't give us a choice because if I order one or two and I need some later on, I'm gonna wait five hours for it. So clearly that was not in line with the Sanbus in-lab turnarounds and clearly something was going on here. So I investigated. And I look at the stats for a year period. They started the green block first. You can see 12,000 samples a year. Guys, this is a big, big user. Now, if we move to the yellow blocks and the red uh, lettering, you will see that during certain times of the day, the samples that is drawn by the hospital differs but most definitely your highest number of samples are drawn between eight in the morning and one o'clock in the afternoon. Now, if you look at the time of your courier trips and you see there's a trip collecting, picking up at the hospital at 6.05, and then at 9.05, there's another trip, but clearly the eight to nine samples, thinking about the rush early morning in a ward, the, the eight to nine samples might not be at the pickup point yet at nine o'clock meaning they are gonna stand over until 12 o'clock trip. And if you look at the number of samples that is drawn between nine and one, it's a huge amount. Now, if the, the 1,060 samples drawn between 11 and 12, and even the 1,120 samples drawn between 12 and one, they're not gonna be on the five past 12 trip. They're gonna wait until the four o'clock in the afternoon trip. And now we started to understand why the doctors are feeling there is a five hour delay and why they would rather order three units up front than uh, space their orders. So what we did, uh, we sat down and we facilitated a meeting with uh, the courier company and we said, shouldn't we implement an additional trip? The other thing that I want to draw your attention to is the blue blocks. Now, keeping in mind, that a blood bank, we've got 84 blood banks, we are servicing almost 500 transfusing facilities. Uh, a blood bank services several hospitals. Looking at the blue blocks, you need to consider sending bulk samples in one trip. And the bulk workload that's coming through the door and the fact that you cannot work faster than you are able to and the increased turnaround times and the effect again of the increased turnaround time on the doctor's perception of how long it will take him to get the product and therefore it will influence his ordering practices. So how did we solve this problem? We talked about it. We sat down and we talked about it. We evaluated the facts, we monitored the timelines and the samples like you've just seen and we implemented the additional trip. We also realized that maybe internally, the nursing staff were not aware that it makes a big difference whether they take that sample down quarter to nine or 10 past nine. So there was internal communication in the hospital to make sure that there was no delays in getting samples to the pickup point. What did we observe? We definitely saw improved ordering patterns and obviously more improved and appropriate transfusion practices. But the most important thing for Sanders is there was less delay in patient treatment. Let's move to a completely different uh, case study. We need to implement the use of alternatives in South Africa. But my question is, do we truly understand the constraints that all of our colleagues all over the country in all levels of healthcare is facing when we say implement X, Y, or Z? This is, you know, you see a movie and say based on a true story, this is based on a true Sandra story. So we've interacted with many stakeholders around alternatives. And we thought, okay, let's look at cell saver technology in South Africa. And their voice was, 
I don't have access to it. I don't have access to cell service. I don't have access to IV iron, but let's focus on cell service. At the same time, Sanders was talking about, can we possibly supply a wider range of services to the country? So we discussed, very excited at a meeting, uh, we discussed the potential service delivery models and pilot sites, and how can we start delivering a cell saver service to hospitals. And then we took a step back and we said, let's ask the users. So last year, between October and December, we circulated a cell saver technology survey. We circulated to the management of 354 hospitals. Um, and the reason we did to the management is because we figured that if we ask people in managerial positions, at least they will be able to filter it down to more of their staff. And you know, when you sit in a meeting and um, you say, let's do X, Y, and Z, and they say, yeah, but go and talk to province because they don't listen to us. So we went to province as well, and we sent them the, the, the surveys as well. We sent it out a total of around 650 times to different role players. We received a slightly um, sad 155 responses, but although we were very despondent at first, those 155 responses gave us a beautiful picture in the end. What did we find? 20% was public, uh, private sector, 79% of our participants were in the public sector and 1% of our participants had a foot in both worlds. 66% of our respondents were urban working and 33% were is in, a, in a rural healthcare safety. So we asked you them, are you in a purely management position? Are you in a purely clinical position? Or are you having a dual function, clinical and management? And that was the breakdown. Then we said, if you have to rate the statement on how true it is for you personally, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the statement, I have adequate knowledge to use cell saver technology? They did not even rate themselves five out of 10. And that is the clinical and the clinical plus management setting. Then we asked, please rate for us. I have adequate knowledge to advise others on cell saving. And the scoring even dropped. It was interesting for me to see that the, the dual setting group actually now had a higher score than the purely clinical setting group. And when I thought about it, I thought, well, maybe because it, once you are in a management type position as part of your job, you are likely to be having a more, little bit more experience under the belt. And maybe that is why you feel you can better advise. But still, we haven't reached five out of 10. And then we ask, especially in the management area of healthcare, we said, I have adequate knowledge to inform decision-making and planning. And you can see that again, very poor schools, their self-perception of whether or not they have adequate knowledge is very low across the board. We then moved on with a couple of more interesting questions. And just for, for information's sake, the green is the group that is currently using cell service. The pink is the guys that does not have access to cell saving at the moment. We keep that perspective. We asked the, the currently using group, what is your strongest motivator to use cell saver technology? And you can see immediate access, one hands down. Yes, a bigger group in the cl purely clinical, but even in the dual setting group, 75% of the participants felt that that is the main motivator to use cell saving. Then we asked the group who does not have access to cell saving at the moment, and they said, what would be your strongest motivator to use cell saving? And we are back to immediate availability. Here it was interesting for me to note that your clinical management, your dual setting, which is more a managerial, says immediate availability carries a stronger value to them than the purely clinical. And when I thought, think back about my, of myself when I was in the clinical setting, I moaned endlessly because I could not get my blood products to my patients. I had to wait for a driver or I had to wait for the next EMS trip, but 
now I understand why the managers actually feel the immediate availability is a very strong driver. They're tired of all of us moaning in their ears. Going back to the group that is currently using it, we said, what is the biggest challenges that you are experiencing? And the purely operational group, the clinical group, says availability of consumables. 50% have said, that's my biggest challenge. Interestingly enough, the clinical management, the dual setting group, 100% of them said their biggest challenge is the availability of trained operators. And I can just hear the doctors and the nursing moaning at the departmental meetings to the head of department saying, it's no use, I have a cell save, I don't have anybody to operate it. So I can just, I've got it, I'm having a, having a little bit of sympathy for the, the poor managers in, in working out there. Going back to the group who's not currently using cell safe. Now these two, I, I documented both because they were so close together that I cannot say the one is really a, a, the top reason. And they both had the same reasons in the same order, equally close together. And the reason why they are not using it is lack of access and lack of sufficient knowledge indications. Then we ask the same group who currently don't have access to cell savers and we say, what would be the strongest demotivator for you to not use cell savers? And again, both the clinical and the dual setting group had the same answers in the same order. And the first one was, where do we find trained operators and where do we find consumables? So you can clearly see a pattern developing here. Then we moved over to the guys who's mostly in management and we asked, what would be your strongest motivator for potential use? And both the dual setting and the purely management, it was the cost of healthcare that is their strongest motivator. So healthcare cost clearly is important to the decision makers in the country. We also asked which, what do you think would be your biggest obstacle? And this I found probably the most interesting of all. If you look at the purely management group, they thought their doctors would not buy into it. But if you look at the top part of the slide, the doctor's main concern was, I want it immediately, I want consumables, I want access, I want trained operators, I want uh, indications on when to use it. It's almost as if the doctors already is buying into it and starting to see what they need to go ahead, whereby the purely management group thinks they're not going to get buy-in from their doctors. There's a communication disconnect. And then also lack of awareness. Now, when you move over to the clinical management, the dual setting group, they have got a little bit more operational approach to this. And for them, it's the logistics, getting the equipment, getting the consumables that they see as the biggest obstacle in South Africa to implement. So where does this leave us? Clearly, there are certain things stronger and certain aspects coming up weaker. But what we can see is that there's a definite education component if we want to uh, promote this specific alternative to transfusion. And this is indications operating the equipment. And although this is a very small study, this actually brought me, as I was doing the, the presentation for you, I was wondering, maybe we should publish this very small study. And although everybody is going to say it's too small, at least we would have gotten them talking. And in that sense, it's also an awareness creation. But there's also a clear second component to this. And that is around the logistics of having the alternatives available. And I think that is the reason why Sanders decided we, we are going to start looking for a pilot site this year and a feasible pilot model. So if there's any volunteers out there, give me a shout, please. You'll save me a lot of work. Um, but we really want to do a, a pilot this year on deli delivering such a service. We've learned with the 24-hour blood on returnable basis hampers that only when you pilot do you see the true nature of the beast. And once we know that, now we can move further to promote broader access to the appropriate settings. Because cell saver ticks bring me to the last case study, and that is around ICD-10 codes. So what if we don't use it? 
And in case you were wondering, the lady on the right probably works in the IT department in Sambas. She has access to the data. She knows what's happening behind the scenes. So we have now, as a collective, managed to draft a good cell saver technology action plan for South Africa. We are addressing the findings of the bigger survey we did. And through collaboration, we are finding solutions and things are looking good for South Africa. And we decide collectively that we now want to promote broader availability of cell saver technology to the guys who's holding on to the purse strings in healthcare. And these guys say, that's fine, but you need to supply us with some information to prove the need for broader access to cell saver technology in South Africa. And they have two requests from us. And when I say us, it's the collective. We're all in this together now. And they have two requests for us. They say, please supply us with the literature based, according to ICD-10 codes, list of conditions where patients will benefit from cell saver technology. And we're a little irritated with the use of the word will. We would have preferred might or could, but you know what? We can write this motivation around the word will and move them over to could or might. And you say, we have got the, the clinicians, we can put this down on paper, we can quote the literature, we've got this, no problem. Then they also ask, please supply us with information on how often and how many red cells are ordered for this same list of ICD-10 uh, conditions. And you go, yeah, Petrolise is always bragging about the IT department in Sanders. She must now put her money where her mouth is and she must help us with information. And the first thing that goes through my mind is, I wonder how big my potential patient pool is. Because if we want to motivate for a country, five or 10 or even 20,000 cases is not enough. We need numbers. So let me go and have a look where the blood is going to in South Africa and how many of those are potentially part of what we can use to motivate for this. And obviously, let's take 2019. If you look at the Guinean obstetrics, there is a, a huge part of that population that would fit nicely into the cell saver technology realm. General surgery, the same. Orthopedics, trauma, cardiothoracic surgery. Those are our first stops. Now, we would go and look in that group of patients if we can find a connection between the red cells and the uh, uh, indications for cell saver technology. But now if you think about what happens in a hospital, quite often doctors mistake the form that they fill in and where they tick the disciplines, gynaeopsteads, ICU, trauma, whatever. They think that that box needs to be ticked to indicate to us where the blood must go. So I'm in theater and I'm ordering blood for a patient that is going to go to ICU and therefore I'm ticking ICU. So let's not throw out the ICU patients. That's a potential source of, of numbers we can work with. And the ones that's unallocated, well, you know, maybe I'm naive, maybe I'm just overly positive, but maybe they didn't put in departments because they were under stress, because the patient was having blood gushing out on the floor. Let's not throw them out as well. So we've got a potential patient pool for 2019 for which we can go and delve for information between 330,000 and almost 500,000. So by this time, I'm very excited. I can see us writing a marvelous motivation. And now I go and look at the top 10 ICD-10 codes that we used for red cell orders. And please keep in mind that our blood bank staff may only capture what you write on the form. We cannot decide for ourselves. And that is what's happening in South Africa. 634,000 red cells were issued in 2019 without ICD-10 codes. I cannot use those numbers to help you write a motivation. Anemia unspecified, D64.9. And the sad part is many of these patients is marked gynean obstetrics it's the block of active bleeding is ticked, but the ICD-10 code on the form is D64.9. Blood transfusion without a report to diagnosis, ZZ something, other medical care. How are we going to write a motivation to our funders to link your list of indications for cell saving? 
to the list of in ICD-10 codes that red cells are issued for in South Africa. And I fully acknowledge that completing forms is a pain, but it is in the best interest of our patients. And what we have done with two hospitals thus far, we've had them draft a list of the most commonly used ICD-10 codes in every ward. They stick it on the wall and three o'clock in the morning when you have to fill the blood request form, you don't have to go to D64.9 just because you're tired, you actually have a list in your ward. So like I promised, uh, I did show you the summary and this is what the summary means in words. We must never underestimate the power of data, monitoring and effective discussions. We must assist our facilities with less academic resources or PBM experience with solutions that speaks to what they need. Our worlds differ, our understanding differ, our challenges differ and our available options differ. And when we work with the other party, we must work with what they have available. We must not start off or focus on which of our expectations they are not able. Thank you so much for listening. And once again, I appreciate the opportunity. I hope I've left you enough time for, for questions. Wow, Petrolise, thank you so much. Um, that was such a different take from the usual and so refreshing and so interesting. And so many things I wanted to discuss with you afterwards. <laughs> There's so much potential in, in what you've, sh you've shown us. So thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. So the floor is open for questions. If you want to just uh, either speak up or put a question in the chat box. Um, but can I start by asking about the cell saver technology that you are thinking to help the hospitals implement? What, what, we, what are you thinking of? Um, thanks, Werner. So when Mike and myself first sat down and we started talking about this, we saw this as we don't have to have a set service delivery model. You can have a model that speaks to the need of a specific setting. So in one setting, you might only need consumables. You're stuck in Springbok, and when you send that, when you get an ambulance trip to come in to refill your emergency fridge blood, why not get your cell saver kit from the blood bank? At least you're not dependent on supply chain and logistics. And because you don't use it often, your hospital is not going to want to order 100 or 500 of these kits and go. So that's the one take on it. The other take on it was, and, and that was more from the, the perspective of how can we develop our staff? How can we make their life interesting and build their scope? And could we not ultimately move to having some of our blood bank staff trained as cell saver operators? And um, although we can't have them uh, in the blood bank an extra person 24 hours a day, we could very much, let's say a setting where elective surgery lends itself to cell saving, we could book the cell saver or book the operator. And, and we can, again, a different operating model where you could either have the person, the person and the machine, just the consumables in the machine. And, and truly it would depend on where we find a suitable pilot site and therefore my my invitation, if anybody thinks, oh, we would like to participate and test this, we need to pilot and, and start learning from, from our practical experience. We're still very much open to, to any possibilities. No, oh, thank you. That's, that's interesting. And I see in the chat box, there was the same question from uh, Lungesile Chile. Thank you for that. And the, the equipment or the kits that you, you've got in mind, is that a specific uh, type of system? Because it sounds quite interesting um, to have something that you can order and use wherever. Can you tell us a bit more about that? So we, we, we have not made, again, we don't want to make a decision that doesn't fit the, the stakeholder that we're going to pilot with. Um, okay. It's no use that Sandus makes a decision that doesn't fit the user. And, and that is why yeah, I yeah. with the mobile. We might think it's fantastic and the poor user on the ground is seeing the backside of it. So all of yeah. that uh, is open and open for discussion. 
as we plan the pilot. That's great. Now, in the in 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 some some European countries like the UK, for instance, and Italy, I know the hospitals actually get individualized feedback on, on their doctors practices that Sandbase would be able to assist with so the doctors can get personal feedback on uh, on the ordering practice and perhaps how that compares with their peers even though the peers might, might not be mentioned by name just sort of to get an idea of where they fit because it seems to to be one of the most powerful tools to change practice among surgeons um, they found that they use a lot more blood than colleagues they um they they change practice is that something that you think blood services and maybe sandbase specifically could could offer? Yeah. um i i hope you can hear me clearly i'm getting a bit of audio break up so so i do hope that i'm still audible Currently, yeah we, that is we why can we hear are you. so excited about our pbm fact sheet because the mother report of the pbm fact sheet we can actually drill down per hospital, per department, per ward, and per MP number of the person who requested the blood product. We don't work on names, we work on registration numbers. Mm. So sure. that we do have the ability to supply already. I think that could be very useful if, if a head of department or a head of a PBM group in a hospital, or maybe even a blood utilization or hospital transfusion committee takes the initiative to get some of that data not not in a to use in a punitive fashion but more to create awareness and uh, and show people what what is happening around them that could be very interesting i see we've got a comment here from dr lorenzo Beretti. lorenzo i'm sure you know petrolisa mm -hmm. is one of the uh, champions in the Eastern Cape and uh, working in Livingston Hospital. He says, I'm sure we would be keen to pilot something. So I think there's your first uh, first uh, big fish that, that bit. That sounds good. Okay, great. Are there any other questions? I'm, I must say there's some hand claps here in the audience and so people clearly enjoyed it. I loved it. I think they, we're looking forward to hear how you're going to roll out your anemia iron plans. I think that is really very exciting and very interesting so look forward to that and uh, again what a motivation is never and this is a key message today we must not think that we cannot do patient blood management if we cannot do just one thing that you can do even if you can just start to create awareness of ordering single units of blood and treating iron deficiency, that's already a big step. And then build it up from there and come and get yourself educated. And now I'm speaking to the, um, the choir because you all converted and here. So, um, okay, I've got one more question from Lungisile. Would the actual diagnosis suffice if the ICD-10 code is out of reach at the bedside when filling in the form? Um, unfortunately, that is the big headache. Our blood bank technologists and technicians are not allowed to choose an ICD-10 code. They are legally only allowed to capture what is supplied on the form. And that is why there is such a huge chunk of unallocated. Okay. Well, it's a nice quick project for someone to do to create a list of 10 most commonly or 20 most commonly used or useful ICD-10 codes and body to supply with that then we can uh, we can share that on the sub-Saharan F group and by the way if anybody is interested to join that WhatsApp group um, you are welcome to contact me and I will quickly put my email address in the chat box. Then uh, you can just send me your mobile phone number and what you do and where you are because I love to produce any newcomer details. We'll add you to the group and then you will be aware of any 
talks like this or conferences or new things that happens. We share articles, we shared some nice articles and things this week. Um, you're very welcome to join a very vibrant, excited group. Excellent. I think it was great. I'm going to say a big thank you again to Petra Lisa for your time, preparation. A lot of thought goes into making a, 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 a presentation that is not just informative but also nicely structured. Really appreciate it. Thanks for sharing some original data that is so interesting. And also special thanks to Karen Fenton, Cheryl, um, who was in all the organization in the background and the registrations. Thank you very much. We thank ECHO, University of New Mexico, as well as the ECHO team. This is really an international uh, collaborative effort. Uh, thank Prof. Chris Casianides. So uh, the father of this whole Astro Foundation and all the things that happen here. Thank you very much, Chris. Work with you. There's a feedback form that will be available in the chat. Please give us feedback. We want to make this better and better. If you want to listen to this presentation again, or you want to go to one of the previous presentations, we have a, a patient blood management session, as you know, once a month. Go to the Gastro Foundation website. Again, the web address is in the chat box. If you want to join us on Saturday, you can go to the Gastro Foundation website or email Karen Fenton. Details in the chat box once again. And yep, there you can see some of the program on the screen. And with that, thank you especially to the Gastro Foundation and also to our sponsors. Um, the, you know, things like this is not possible with sponsors. And supported number of um, partners in the pharmaceutical industry, Takeda, Asino, Amgen, Equity, and Aspen. And we're very, very thankful for your support. Although we don't promote any specific products, um, I think these are companies who have recognized that if we all come together, we can really make patient blood management a reality in South Africa, and we're very excited to, to partner with all. So thank you very much for that. Next week is a public holiday, so there will be no G-ECHO session. Um, there will be a, a patient blood management session probably towards the end of July, but that will be confirmed. We, I'm very excited about Professor Mashiku uh, Sacheri, head of gastro, and also in the audience today, um, who will speak new technology first in Africa. Uh, spiral enteroscopy and how that fits into working up a patient with unexplained iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. I'm personally really excited about that uh, topic. So please um, make sure that you monitor all the invites that you can join us for that session, uh, especially for those of you. I, I noticed a quite a number of people who are not necessarily gastroenterologists, uh, but we'll advertise it on the WhatsApp as well. So with, I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for coming. It was great to have you and uh, have a great week. Bye-bye.